understand, um, I think there are actually some uh, original Quantel employees in the audience. Yeah, <laughs> which is great. Right? Um, we also have an original Quantel employee. As well. Okay, so yeah, feel free to, to come in there. Um, this talk is being accompanied by an exhibition that's downstairs, and the exhibition is, uh, has been put together in collaboration with the Computer Art Society, which I'm involved in. And it's one of a series of regular exhibitions here in Phoenix. Feel free to uh, grab a seat. Um, which began uh, some months ago with an exhibition by Ernest Edmonds. We're now doing the Pontel Paint Box exhibition, and next month we're doing an exhibition involving an artist, Bill <coughs> Brown. So if you find today interesting, hopefully maybe you'll join us for a future one. Um, the artwork downstairs has been curated by Adrian Wilson, who's put together a representative selection of work. Um, showing really, I suppose, the, well, you'll explain it more, but the really the capabilities of the Quantel paint box, um, which was a pioneering um, electronic image manipulation device that predated what we might regard as the de facto uh, image manipulation device, Photoshop, by many years. Um, Adrian, as an artist, photographer, user of the paint box, has lots of interesting things to say. And it was really a collaboration between him and the ideas of putting this exhibition together and the Computer Art Society in this venue initially. That we thought, yes, we can turn this into something that I, I think is going to grow beyond what we've already done. Now, we also have Kim here, who was an original paint box employee and an artist who works, um, has worked, I say works, has worked with the Quantel paint box and continues to work um, in graphic design. I'm sure she'll explain more about her work. What I hope will happen today is that this is part of re triggering interest in the um, Quantel paint box. It was also part of maybe starting to get recognition that this device was very important in the history of computer art and design. And we're doing the exhibition here, it's fairly small, you'll see 20 pieces downstairs. We're taking it down to London where it's gonna be on show at the BCS, British Computer Society's offices. And I think next year we'll do it bigger somewhere else, in a gallery, I don't know where, but we'll find somewhere to do it. Um, and I think the interest is gonna just grow and grow. Um, so we have, it being recorded, so hopefully if you ask any questions, you won't mind your questions being recorded. Um, we're going to take roughly an hour or so for the talk, and then maybe half an hour for questions, but we're going to play it by ear. Maybe you'll be so engrossed, we'll end up taking longer, but maybe let's try and keep it to a, an hour and a half. Um, I'm going to sit to the side and monitor the stream, make sure that that all works okay. But really, it's over to Adrian and Kim, who are... Um, in control for the next hour at least. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Hello to everyone at home, all six of them. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday I got the opportunity to interview Paul Keller, who you may have heard of, who uh, is a humble guy, but basically he was very involved in the creation of the paint box. And before heading to see Paul, uh, I have the New York Times on my phone, I opened the New York Times, and there was Farhad Manju, who's the tech, uh, opinion columnist, but he's the technical expert, the New York Times. And his article began, Photoshop is the granddaddy of image editing apps, the OG of our airbrushed, face-tuned media ecosystem, and a product so enmeshed in the culture that it's a verb, an adjective, and a frequent, frequent lament of rappers. Photoshop is also widely used. And I was like, really? You're the tech guy from the New York Times, and you think that Photoshop is... Was the beginning. The beginning. So that was kind of bizarre to read on the day that I was going to interview Paul Keller. Today, I picked up an edit box. So 20 years previously to that, in 2001, a uh, guy in Soho uh, ordered an edit box, which, as he reminded me today, he could have bought a small flat in London or an edit box. And he bought this edit box. And when the guys delivered it, the DHL or whoever it was, they were walking down with their trolley down in Soho. And some guys came up and said, oh, that's for us. 
And uh, the guy said, oh, great, Here, you want to sign this piece of paper? And um, it was in the news how these, these guys had, had <laughs> nothing to do, had no idea what a pay box was, and uh, stole this, this uh, edit box. The next day, Victor had a brand new replacement edit box because that's what Quantel did. That's 2001. Uh, now, we all heard about Photoshop being um, the granddaddy of them all, but I like to remind people that Adobe didn't exist when the paint box was launched. It didn't even exist as a company before it was launched. So, and we had obviously this uh, video paint box in 1981, but in 1985, there was a photo quality paint box, which you worked on and demonstrated, etc. cetera, um, which literally by five years um, uh, was the uh, de facto, photo, uh, what we call Photoshop now. And in fact, this lady here, I first became aware of her work because she was on the front cover of a book that was called... Paintboxed. Paintboxed. <laughs> So, and that was 1993, I think, wasn't it? 1994, I think 94. it came out. So, paint boxed was actually a verb for years yeah. before Photoshop was. Now, um, the bizarre thing is, I, I almost think of it as a Pandora's box. So, two years ago, um, I was doing some uh, ridiculing of NFTs in New York, and I, I was spraying post-no NFTs in New York, and a friend said to me, you know, everyone's looking for this early digital artwork. And I said, oh, I've got a box of that stuff in my mum's attic in Manchester. And uh, me and Duncan, who's here, uh, we were lucky recipients of, of a paint box uh, that was given to, there were three paint boxes given out to be shared between nine art colleges in 1985 by Quantel. And uh, I worked on it from 85 to 90 as a photographer and basically did what we now would call Photoshop. But at the time, you couldn't, you know, email or, or you couldn't Google who else was doing it. Um, but it turns out I was the first person in the world to do that. But I had no idea. Now, I've got that stuff out and it's become a Pandora's box because people say to me, how have you found David Hockney's original artwork? And I go, well, somebody had it in their attic that, that was thrown out by Quantel. And somebody said, how have you found this work from Keith Herring? And the Keith Herring Foundation said, hang on a minute, you, you, you're telling me that he flew to Rome six months before he died just because he wanted to go on a paint box. And he spent three days while he was suffering from age, you know, he was going to shortly die. And he went there specifically for this. How come we don't know about it? Yeah. And I said, well, I read about it in his diaries that you published, that he talks about it. And at the end of his description of it, he goes... Paintbox has revolutionized the way we see about art in the world, and why hasn't anyone noticed? Which is the quote we use on the, uh, on the poster in the book. Um, and it's really weird that from 1989 to now, but whether it's a New York Times supposedly intelligent person who knows his, his onions, nobody knows. We need to tell them. So, <laughs> so what's weird is... Uh, I, I tend to apologize because I do come across a bit like Tom Cruise uh, on the sofa at uh, Oprah's. And, I, and it's just weird to me because it's all this exciting stuff and nothing against any other computer art. But this is really interesting stuff. It's, you know, titles for Max Headroom. It's, uh, it, you know, videos, pop videos, all these things. Um, and nobody knows. And they're not aware of it. They're not, that's the thing. They're not aware yeah. of it. So, for instance, you'd say something like, okay, well, there's the... Um, anchor dancing cows, which as John Morell points out, when the anchor dancing cows came out, his mum called, called him and said, hey, John, I've just seen this amazing ad and they've trained these cows to dance. And he said, uh... mum, that's the company where I work with us, what we can make cows do. <laughs> uh, and then you get Silence of the Lambs, uh, the post of Silence of the Lambs, uh, that was done on a uh, graphic paint box, uh, the Nirvana baby, the famous baby album cover, um, I pointed out to people, well, that was done on paint box, actually. And somebody said, yeah, why was, how, how was that being paint box? And I said, the, the dollar bill and the, the hook wasn't actually in front of the baby, you know, at that Underwater. time. Underwater. So, yeah. So it's really weird to me that all this stuff is out there. And what's amazing is, 
you know, a bit like, you know, Scientology, you know, oh, uh, <coughs> excitement. People, once they see it and, and hear about the effect it had, um, they're just completely amazed. And the people, which is quite a few people in this room, are all just like, like me. We've all got the proverbial, like you, we've just had a box in our attic. Yeah, box it. I've got a whole vault full of stuff <laughs> that we just did. And yeah. we didn't realize we were doing amazing stuff. And we didn't realize that we were laying the foundations for the internet and everything. I had a guy who, who I did a demonstration of the paint box. And he said, has anyone done an NFT of the paint box? I was like, no, you can come and do an NFT on the paint box if you want, you know. And he came down and he said, great, I'll, I'll take away, a, I'll come and get a JPEG. And um, I said, no, no, you can't, sorry. <laughs> and he said, why not? I said, the JPEG wasn't actually invented yet, you know. <laughs> so it's funny, just like, the whole thing is just, to me, is, is, is hilarious. But also, I feel, uh, in not a weird way, but I've, I've ended up channeling all these people and become this conduit that, that's just yeah. come out. And it's not for any other reason that I just sprayed this anti-NFT thing on a wall. Um, and it's just it's just crazy. Um, so I would guess that lots of you have familiarity with the paint box. Um, but obviously, we'd like to explain you know, where it originated. I don't know. Kim, Kim said, I'm worried because I don't like speaking. But... I said, don't worry, you know, nobody's, nobody's scary here. So They're terrifying. Look at them. <laughs> for, for people who are watching, uh, uh, and obviously people out there who don't know, so and I think Peter, Peter's here, right? Let's put your hand up, Peter. There you go, Peter. I don't, please, if I'm paraphrasing or get dates wrong or, or whatever, yeah. I, I apologize. But the basic gist of it is that there was a company called, um, there was, didn't, quite become Quantel yet, but basically Quantel was part of a group and it was so successful because it made these things, which sounds simple now, but uh, if you get two video cameras, what happens is there's, there's actually a, a waveform of like, like you can't synchronize two cameras. So in the old days, you switch between two cameras, you got like a black kind of flash and you certainly couldn't put two pictures together. And Quantel worked out that you could have, you could store one picture and put it over the other without the eye actually noticing and do it so fast. Uh, and then we lost lots of money and success from that. The interesting point that Paul pointed out yesterday was uh, there was a Japanese company that basically stole their idea and was trying to sell their idea. So from that point, they patented everything as a protection, not to stop anyone else doing something, but as a protection against having theft against them. So from that, which sounds, I'm not a technical person, but basically there was a Eureka meeting. Can you remember what year even this year, this Eureka meeting was when Paul Keller, the, they always tried to, to, to do this kind of live video uh, painting effect, but the lines were all jaggy. It, was, it wasn't ever going to work. And Paul... Um, Bless him. He's like a Back to the Future guy. He looks yeah, totally yeah. like Back to the Future. So he did as well. Uh, and uh, he can't remember the year of the meeting, but he said, I remember imagining in my head, he said, I, I look at a computer or I look at a machine, I can see how it works. He repairs clocks and creates clocks, etc." And he said, I could just work out in my head the solution, this missing jigsaw piece that would mean that the paint box would work. And I said, how did the rest of the meeting go? And he said, I can't remember. I just remember just sitting there, just being so happy that I thought, oh, this is it. This is the solution. Can you remember even the year of that Eureka meeting? Were you in that meeting? No, there were about uh, three or four people in that meeting. Uh, the first time we showed a paint team, but it was very much like the same effect in 1976. The IBC meeting, broadcasters yawned. They didn't know what they could do with it, and it was horrible. And it was put away for a few years until about 1979, 19. The, the meeting might have been about 1979, so, so what you've got to imagine is, uh, in the old days, as you may remember, you'd have the weather map, and there'd be uh, somebody stood in front of a big screen with some magnetic or sticky letters. Mm -hmm. If you saw Panorama or any of these BBC shows, 
there would be an actual model that would be letter set and you know spinning around and video um that was the analog days and actually you know i thought a lot about how uh paint boxes influenced culture but broadcast tv was actually the last sort of area of 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 creativity that was digitized so if you imagine in 1981 before the paint box was launched you've got the space shuttle launched you could play an atari 2600 on your tv at home you've got all these things you know cd players are going to be invented etc but then you turn on your tv and it was really behind everything else so so uh richard taylor um which is weird because there wasn't really a market for this thing he said okay well let's do a graphics computer that can do all the work of tv graphic designers there's going to be a great demand for it uh which is weird because there was no demand there was no market and so he, he came up with this with this idea of making it real but the key thing is they had the hardware the software and and had this enclosed system like apple uh which is another company that came after quantel uh, <laughs> um, so they had this uh hardware and software that worked absolutely perfectly together but because it was going into the art world they also thought it was really important and did bring in all these artists so they brought in a guy called martin holbrook who created the user interface so everything said you know chalk paint it was they're super all, simple they were all familiar words the most simple user interface ever with the most complex and natural uh, tools right so the key thing was sausage airbrush mixing paints it was a miracle it was American. <laughs> and and it was weird because they one of the key inventions was a um, pressure sensitive stylus if you imagine if you're working on a on a computer in those days you might have to learn programming etc and work with tapes etc you just sat with this stylus that was you know just this and instead of looking down while you're painting or drawing and doing graphics you just looked at a screen and and that's it everything was just done with a pen i i have a paint box now I don't need a keyboard, I don't need a mouse, nothing. It's just all done with this pen. So everything was incredibly intuitive. Um, and that really carried on through. I don't know another tech company, even though it was aimed at a market, that brought in so many creatives. No. This and was... Kim, so Kim would have been one of those creatives. I was at, I was at Middlesex and there was a, a paint box shut in a room, nobody used it. It's a, amazing machine you know at the time uh, there were machines computers that printed out black and white numbers you know and that was all exciting but this was a, a paint box so you could you could take a shot of something put it in the paint box and paint on it it was interactive it was amazing it was the it's like a digital thread that started back this was i think 1983 I was an undergraduate so it was absolutely amazing it was revolutionary I remember graduating with paint box art that I mixed with mixed media and printed out. It was only one MB, so it was very jaggy, even though we had a soft edge paint paintbrush. Um, it was amazing. So I went straight out of college into launching MTV because MTV Europe was launched in, in the early 80s and there was no one that could make this stuff. So I ended up rolling out the brand, which was really weird. I was about 19, I think, 20, because of paint box because I could, because I could use it. There was just nobody that could use it. It was just such an expensive machine. But because we had access at school, you could basically go anywhere in the world and get a job where there was a paint box, which was, about, I think there were about 50 at the time in the world. So I remember doing all these TV titles live, live animations on the end of a pen, very weird. Um, and thinking, well, maybe it's an idea to go and ask Quantel, perhaps I can work for them, you know? Because I'd heard that they flew you all over the world to show people how the machines worked. And uh, sure enough, that's what I did. And uh, it was amazing. Company credit card, <laughs> 21, flying over, waking up in Japan, thinking, where am I? Oh, Japan. Fabulous. You know, showing uh, the new software or hardware that had come out. <clears throat> so whether it was a carousel or a how, you know, it was absolutely amazing. Because I had no idea what I was going to show. And I... It was so intuitive that I could actually edit with it and show how a Harry worked or a Henry worked uh, live at that moment. 
So it was so intuitive that you didn't actually have a practice role. Like at NAB in America, which is the CES now, um, there were several machines launched, two years running. I remember being sitting there with 600,000 people walking by and having to animate something on a carousel, having never seen it. And it was so intuitive, you could do it. Absolutely amazing. Small miracle. So yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it is an amazing machine. And but it's um, hard to unthink where we are now. That's the thing I think. It is, you know, it, we think about pre-internet and we've sort of got yeah. past the idea of, you know, before pre digital and we think about, you know, before on your phone, but all those things all came from, you know, I, I give the analogy with, with the uh, interior design, uh, you know, our grandmothers in back in the day or us or whatever, we'd have no idea about interior design. But there'd be all these TV makeover shows, and all of a sudden we've got an opinion about, well, we've all got an opinion about that, that grass stuck on the wall and you know the color of you know this wall or whatever, because we've watched all those shows. And the thing is, as much as we talk about screen time now, people in those days would sit for five hours in front of you. You come home from work and you sit for five hours, you watch the early evening news, and then you watch all those shows and you watch the titles, etc. And all those digital graphics. Um, the, offer, the quote often given when you would go with Quantel and you'd say, hey, you want to buy this? And it, it was literally a quarter of a million dollars or 150,000 pounds. And they say, well, that's a lot of pencils. And there's, yeah. and that's true. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's it some people who, who couldn't afford it. Um, but there's an, a great interview in, uh, funnily enough, the New York Times, ironically, where, the, where they're talking about the Olympics in 1984. And certainly there were, there were sporting events then which would drive technology like now. You know, we all used to see in the World Cup and there's a, the line for offside or, you know, spinning around. Sport has always driven broadcast technology uh, and the Olympics. And the, anyway, there's a guy from, I think, the boss of ABC talking about, I think they own 12 paint boxes or whatever. And he said, well, the thing is, when we have good graphics, there's two reasons why we want good graphics. We, we can explain things a lot better clearly to our viewers but actually the bottom line is we get more viewers and it was kind of a throwaway line and obviously it's great if you get more viewers you can charge more for your advertising uh, and you're going to beat your competition well the only reason you're going to get more viewers if you're using a paint box is because that's more interesting graphics and it's better graphics and i think we kind of forget that through all that kind of gentle stuff coming through MTV, right through to news programs and weather, we all, when the internet arrived, went, well, actually, I don't like that logo. Uh, and when your grand now orders something on Amazon, she'll trust one company over the other because of their logo, because of, she's had this training, that there was 10 years of training to do with digital um, exposure, of what, it, what it was, obviously as, a, as an operator, if you watch Painting with Light at the end of the David Hockney thing, you know, he goes and he's eight hours and he's, you know, like we all did. You're like, I always called it a, a fruit machine, a slot machine, because you just, you'd be fine. Oh, I'll just go and go on the paint box for 20 minutes. And then Six eight hours, hours later, later yeah. you're just like, <laughs> and you, you, you switch it off and you got this art and everything. But there's nothing there on your, on your pad. Now, we got used to the fact that digital, the, the weather map, the weather channel was the, was the first purchaser in America. Well, the first purchaser of the paint box. Um, and we got used to the fact that weather man was in front of a green screen, all that stuff didn't actually exist. So when the internet came, we didn't think there was a room full of websites. We were like, oh yeah, well, it's, it's digital, like weather maps, they don't really exist. So this is the other thing that I think is important and has been lost. People assume, like that New York Times guy, that there was, there's just this 10 year period where we just suddenly jumped into something yeah. that we're familiar yeah. with. Yeah. And the paint box already there. Yeah. yeah. The paint box is what kind of trained us to understand that. And all the, is it, the annoying thing about NFTs and gaming is people think of the eighties as uh, eight bit and it's the eight bit years. You know, I remember telling my kids that, that the paint box was real time and they went, well, what does that even mean? Yeah. <laughs> But the fact is that you didn't have to program something in and come back the next day and work out, oh, a triangle came out. You just moved your pen. And it was there. And it, yeah. and it moved. And those things were so revolutionary. We do take them for granted now. Um, but at the same time, as I say, this isn't 
this isn't a thing that's amazing because it was just like a point in time. This thing is amazing because it built all our eco structure and all our visual language and how we accept the world now is because the paint box across the world yeah. made us understand that and made us go, well, that's okay for that not to exist. And that's, that's kind of weird that that head flies off there and goes on there, but we know it's not real and, you know, that's fine. It's a very humble company, actually. That's amazing things that were, you know, invented. I remember working with R&D, being you know, I was there to show how the machine worked, but walking down the road to R&D, and you know, they say, well, what, what do you want to see? What do you want? Is there anything you're missing? I'm like, well, yeah, you know, maybe you can make soft edge masks, and we can move things around, and you know, instead of having to restore from one image to another, you, you would save an image behind another one, and then rub away and hope that the image is on the right spot. Otherwise, you'd have to start all over again and put it behind again. You couldn't see it, but it was there, working with two images. So, you know, you'd say, well, you know, maybe you can make a soft edge like a mask and then reverse it and cut it out and move it over here. And you'd be like, why do you want to do that? Well, oh, my God, the whole world will want to do that. Can you make it? So then, same afternoon, I get a call. I say, yeah, we've got something to show you. Oh, wow. So I go off down the road, down to the other factory, and sure enough, these things were sort of written the same afternoon, you know. It was amazing. So the things that we take for granted now were total miracles, as far as I was concerned back then. It was just incredible. And they literally were, uh, I think, Duncan, what didn't you? John said there was, in fact, 35 or 50 artists working full-time doing demonstrating for, for Quantel. Yeah, they had, they had a so there's that. There's, as Kim touched on before, there was these three paint boxes given to nine art colleges, uh, with all the peripherals as well, which you know is like a million pounds worth of uh, of work of of equipment to given up given away. But nobody was said, "Oh, do this, and you have to do this." You know, this is Quantel, and you have to put our logo on or whatever. Like you say, we were lucky because actually we we kind of like. We saw the interest and the, the, you know, we were hooked on it because it was interesting for us. Yeah. Most people, to be honest with you, in colleges, dismissed it. My, my photography college uh, lecturers dismissed it as a fad. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to show it guys, in my, in my guys. degree show. It was like that's not really work. I'm like, what do you mean that's not really work? It's you, digital, you know. You couldn't sell digital <laughs> it's the art. There was, there was no digital art. It wasn't considered. You know, it was, it was very low on the. Scare, you know, it's, it's either dismissed as commercial art or gimmick or, or di it didn't exist even. But there's an organization called SIGGRAPH as well, which is the best. It's like the Oscars of, of graphics world. Mm. You go through their archive now and there's maybe five or ten pieces of Quantel work of any type for the last 20 years, which is crazy. Even they. So that that's what's bizarre for me. Namjoon Paik, who's a famous uh, video uh, manipulator artist, his own museum, there's a picture that's literally the, the, the Quantel paint box um, palette. And the, the curator said, oh, they've stuck like some 16-bit thing on there to make it look like a digital piece of art. They don't know. No. Um, I think it just accelerated enormously at certain points when everyone could do this themselves at home, you know, and it all went to pieces. And it's, <laughs> so yeah. You have to go back in time and explain as you're doing, bring and, it showing what happened and where it's come from. And my analogy would be Google search engine. None of you oh. will ever see the hardware, who makes it, no. from Google search engine, yeah, but true. it affects your whole life. That is the impact that the paint box did to the world, and nobody knows. Well, there were two fridge freezers that you had to take with you if you had one. It was huge. <laughs> it was, you know, you've got your laptop like this now, but they were, it was massive. Yeah. Of course, that's, that was a thing. Yeah, so so <laughs> to us it's it got small. It got small. So our our quest really, you, you know, and it's just something we all. This, this is the other thing, Quantel, uh, uh, Peter is. Everyone looks back on Quantel with rose tinted spectacles, like they really do have this love for it. Now I understand, yeah. most of them in their twenties earning five hundred dollars an hour, so they're, they're going to go. Hey, that was pretty good. Good times, um, but. For instance, like that edit box where they just got a replacement the next day. I spoke to Chris Smith. Fantastic. And he said, oh, we'd have customers and their service contract ran out 
and they need, you know, a card had broken or needed replacing, um, we just replaced it anyway. Yeah. And, you know, it was a really, it was a company that I, I think that really you, you, well, the way we look at technology now, thanks to people like Elon Musk and actually to an extent, Steve Jobs, where you're this, you know, money driven company that's really about manipulating other people um, and getting you hooked on technology. Paintbox and Quantel was the exact opposite of that. Mm. In fact, a couple of times in the last, the last couple of days, I said, well, Paintbox is kind of like AI because if you had an idea, you know, if you're Keith Herring and say, hey, I want to draw this, whatever, you could just do it really easy. So it's easier than actually getting a, a marker out and, and yeah, doing it In a physically. weird way, it's quite similar moments in time, isn't it? But everyone has shot me down and said, it's nothing like AI. And mm. I'm like, why? And they said, because AI basically makes you look like an artist when you're not one. And so they had a, a even though they had all this amazing stuff, curves and all the things that you see on Photoshop now and all the things you could fix, there was no undo button. Oh. And uh, now there's a technical reason for no undo button because it actually is quite hard to undo it. You'd have two layers. And the joke was that Paul, apparently, I think it's a bit of an urban myth, when he was asked why there was no undo button, he said, well, you, we can't undo our software and hardware. And, and he said yesterday, he said, basically, anyone who asks for an undo button as an artist is not a good artist. You know, if you're doing a watercolor or a painting, you don't undo anything. No, exactly. You can't. Yeah. And just because you can undo something doesn't mean you should be able to. Uh, and that's something that we've got used to now. You can fix anything. And when you're working in uh, in TV, you you have no time to say, well, I've got this fourth option that I did, you know, there and kind of go back five levels and whatever, because the director's shouting at you saying, hey, you know, MTV, you know, throw up yeah. the, the icon it's now. Like, it's got to yeah. be this. And, you know, Korea just mm -hmm. won a medal at the Olympics, you know, put that graphic up. So it kind of, uh, it was weird because it, it really did support you. But... There was only two things in, in, in the paint box that we would call effects. One was mosaic, and the other one was a thing called color map. Remember? Color map, that's what it was called. Color map. Um, those are the only two effects. So it didn't, it, you ran out of ideas. It didn't give you any new ideas. Like the same as any design studio didn't give you new ideas. No. But it really did open up all these possibilities. Color map. <laughs> I spoke to one of the one of the, so there's all these great you know there's things that say try it do it whatever, and the, if you wanted to change the color and add curves and you know levels and contrast, it had a thing called fettle, and it's such an English word. But that was all fettle. later. That was like quite, uh, that yeah. was later on. Though. That was on the DPB though. Yeah, but it's. Like... So I said to Alec, like, where where did the word fettle came from? He said, oh, I came up with that. It's so like when you do a casting of a, of a, a in a mold. And you've got the bits on it, and you just knock that off. It's called fettling. But that's what um, used to happen at the R&D. You know, they come up with these wonderful things and call it sort of distract, distract, extraculate thing. And I'm like, what do you mean? Isn't that cut and paste, you know? But like, they change it to, to yeah, what you yeah, said. Yeah, right? that's what happened. So it was a really complicated word. It was an engineering term, you know? <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't think we're going to understand what you're on about. Right. We've changed the name. And it is weird because... You know, you, you wonder, okay, you're in Newbury. You know, we've just been to Newbury and it's just surrounded by fields. Yeah. I mean, it's just the grass, I don't know, the grass valley became, you know, part of it and took it over. Yeah. But it's just it's just on its own as well. It's not, if you look at Silicon Valley, you've got all those other support companies. You've got all that, that system where you can employ other people and, you know, all go to the same bar and talk about it. Quanto was also, bizarrely, a world beater just from a little small town in Berkshire. Which, you know, and the paint box that I think that meeting was, you know, it's two years from having the idea of the paint box, working it out to launching it, and I looked it up. The i the iPhone, I think it was six years before between coming up with the concept oh, of the so iPhone, please, yeah. where Steve Jobs, by the way, said this will never work, and somebody actually kept working on it. Um, so that was six years, and this company came out with this working, you know, thing that took over the world in two years that was not linked to Silicon Valley whatsoever and in America. So, it, again, it's just 
the whole thing is just an unbelievably startling like it doesn't even seem to make sense that, no. that this has happened he had to fly around the world to tell people it's back in the day it's the only way to spread the word so so yeah basically yeah. they obviously had this fantastic product it's so like hot cakes um and and i think it, it, i mean there was waiting lists wasn't there really um i don't know uh it was it was i remember there being a, a difficult period uh, we were at nab and the graphic paint was being launched there was one in la and it suddenly began to hit in america and i think that we sold like seven which was a lot of money back then and so they asked me to stay and stay for like two months in la and i'm like yeah sure and then just to sell and sell and sell it i think it really hit i think that was 1987 which is you know quite early on i guess and it really took off from that point and then even at three quarters of a million guilders so i was in holland at the time after that right half a million pounds each yeah half a million pounds each you know they were selling like hot cake suddenly and there's a lot of money and the other thing is uh Obviously, the, the issue was that you had nobody to operate it. You know, ultimately, these were business machines. You got sold with a machine. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Quantel knew very well yeah. that if you were a demonstrator of this machine and you were paying half a million for it, they're going to say to Kim, who's you know working at Quantel and paid handsomely, but not as much. And also, they had a bursary scheme, etc., where they did like a free. Pay wasn't great. The benefits were fantastic. You know, every all this new fantastic machinery got flown all over the world, right? Um, yeah, and so, offered jobs all over the world. That was the thing. So, when there was a paint box was sold, you were offered a job with a paint box. So, I ended up going to New York, going to LA, ended up in Amsterdam. It's extraordinary. So, I'm off. <laughs> I remember I was very uh, faithful. <laughs> uh, yesterday, I, I walked my uh, wife around Soho. And I was explaining, if you walk around Soho and you had a Quantel pen, you remember there's a whole thing with Mont Blanc pens and everyone's showing off. <laughs> oh, you yeah, in your, in your pocket. You had a little <laughs> Quantel plastic pen. The people who knew, they were like, oh, wow, that guy, that guy. <laughs> so you were like the top of the tree. Funny, yeah. I was paid 500 uh, pounds an hour. Yeah. Uh, to free. So I did, a, sh I did a, a project. I hated doing post. I was doing my own photography, kind of manipulating and stuff. But uh, a guy called Matt Forrest, he was working on, I think it was Bell Telephones. And, um, and the idea was, uh, it was an animated Einstein talking for 30 seconds and whatever. So everything was animated by hand. They had three paint boxes and three operators were working. So it was 24 hours a day, eight hours each, 500 pounds an hour. Yeah. And I think it was three months. That was on one commercial. And actually that's a really sad thing now because the post-production industry really you can put a lot of that down to Quantel. Obviously, there's a, yep. a history of film production in, in the UK. But because Quantel was here and our creativity as well and the fact how our advertising worked and it was a bit more quirky, there's definitely a massive amount of influence that Quantel had. And post-production companies would want the latest paint box or the version of it yep. to tell clients who would all just come in and you'd make Flop. a fortune. Yeah, Make a fortune. So, so yeah, we should... Uh, so, how are we doing for time? That's good. I, I think it would be really interesting if you could maybe talk about the exhibition and you've got that like, behind you. Exhibition? Oh, here we go. You can scroll up. <laughs> <laughs> what and exhibition? And maybe take us through some of the um, images and why you selected them. Yes. So, what happened was, if, if you don't mind me being honest, you said to me, Adrian, I want to do a show of your paint box work at the Computer Arts Society. And I was like, oh, uh, that's nice. Also, very humble. Yeah, yeah, I was basking for a minute. And then I thought, <laughs> well, and then it was the 50th anniversary of the paint box. And then I thought, well, I could do, and there's 20 images. And I thought, well, I could do 15 images and just have five for like a Quantel. And then I was like, that's like saying I'm three times more important than Quantel. And then I thought, oh, well, I could have half the images for mine and half the images would be like mixed. And I was like, I'm not equal to Quantel either. So in the end, I just thought, uh, it's the 50th anniversary. I'll just pick, and from the archives that I've, got, I've managed to get and the connections I've got uh, and the knowledge, I thought, well, I'll just show the variety because it is annoying. It's, as much as it's amazing for me to enjoy, you know, all the stuff that's come out, it's annoying that people do just have this ignorance um, 
about what 80s art was. So one of the things, obviously, Keith Herring, uh, an icon of 80s. I don't know if you recognize this guy. There's graffiti and everything. So super famous. So what I did was, we did, um, we came up with this list. Now, Paul has never done anything like that. He wrote um, the introduction to the book, which to me is absolutely astounding. And filming him yesterday, and it's the 50th anniversary, it, it's just great that we actually get all this stuff written down because uh, I think it really adds to it. So obviously we talked about Paul coming up with the idea uh, in that meeting. Um, and then Keith Heron. So... I don't know if you can, you can read that, right? I should read it for people who can't. Every time I use a graphic paint box, I rethink the whole concept of an image. The computer has cho totally changed the whole concept of what composes and defines a picture space. Now, the other thing is, you know, talking about art, people are now talking about NFTs and, you know, the influences of art and how it's changing and what's real and not. All of this discussion was going on in the 80s. You, you know, I remember reading this this. French artist talking about, well, I've done this art on a computer, but I don't own it. The computer owns it because all I see is it on a screen, which is not really the computer, it's a yeah. screen, or I get a print and that's not in the computer anymore. No so, original. so the computer has it. Mm. It, it's, it kind of, it's my copyright, but it belongs to the computer. So all this philosophy about what we're talking about now, about when, whether the NFTs really exist, again, well, art doesn't exist. None of this art exists. That that doesn't exist. It's just zeros and ones, which we're all used to now. You look at your phone, it's just zeros and ones. It's not a picture. So, paint box owner, I managed to get... So, this was only two years ago I did this graffiti. I've now got a paint box, done this show, met all these amazing people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just it's the first time we meet, by the way. It's nuts, nuts. It's really weird. Um, put this book together, but... <laughs> And then, obviously, talking about digital, the designer. So, Kit, as much I was, I was a peripheral uh, character, even though I did something interesting. Uh, it was a struggle, and it wasn't uh, as significant and involved as what you did, because you were at the factory. You were advising people on what to call things and changes to make. Then you were flying around the world. Then it, you know all the stuff you've done. Okay. Um, it's you know it's way you you're way more. Uh, important he's, in the he's story. Doing it again. <laughs> um, You've cur curated. So what I did was, so somebody said to me, hey, well, if you're going to do a show, you're going to get loads of women artists. And I was like, there are loads of women artists. <laughs> this is the other thing. Well, you know, that is a funny thing. Back you, then, you know, they were at the beginning of that technology. It was the most incredible thing to be young and female and travel the world. Nobody, it, it didn't happen. I met men everywhere. Sorry, it sounds terrible, but there were only men everywhere. So whenever I would turn up in Japan with a paint box, they would put me in as Mrs. Someone and expect the husband to be there to do the work, you know. But he wasn't there, obviously. It was just me. I'm like, it's just me. <laughs> but so that it was, was extraordinary to be, you know, to have you know, to have that exposure and independence at that point. Because the broadcast industry is a very male-dominated, you know, techie kind of, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, this is back, RGB. Certainly that back then. Yeah. I've had to learn stuff. That, but there's a thing. That RGB is not CMYK. It's RGB. You have three color signals on your TV. So I get these three cables. And I said, but this cable says yellow. It doesn't say green. And then they said, well, yeah, but that's actually green. It's not really yellow. We just put yellow on it. But it's like green, really. And you just, there's a whole thing. And, you know, there's this distrust of designers. Yeah. This is actually the, uh, I know this is going off this again, but the paint box as well. Uh, I spoke to a guy called Michael Katz. He was a union leader in New York. So the other thing is all these broadcast uh, industries, it was all still unionized. So you've got this machine that comes in that in theory is going to destroy yeah. the graphics department. So how could that be a successful machine? And Michael explained it. He said, well, when you were in the, when you're a graphic designer, your pay grade was a certain way because you created something that then was filmed by the cameraman and then it went live. 
the cameraman got more money than you yeah. because that was going to the screen at home. So you were like a set decorator or, or anything like that, or a makeup artist, because what you did was filmed. But you said, when the paint box arrived, our pay shot up because all our work went straight online. And he said, the bosses were happy. So the unions were all really happy. And then the bosses were happy because they got more viewers mm. and then they got more advertising money. So he said, it's one of those really few inventions as well where everybody benefited. So this... Jennifer Bartlett, who sadly passed uh, at the end of last year. And uh, she, I don't know if you, if you go online, there's a series called Painting with Light. Uh, that basically, 1985, a guy came up with an idea for this pilot. And it was based on a, a, a 1950s or 60s thing with Picasso, where he's painting on a piece of glass. It's a black and white thing, and it becomes color. Um, so this, this guy had this idea, who worked with Hockney, and he said, oh, is this... this thing called the paint box let's do a series of six i'll get you in david and i will um you know we'll use that as bait you know as like a pilot to to get a commission from the bbc <coughs> now again i spoke i found all this original david hockney artwork and even on david hockney's website it says he worked on the paint box a software uh, some paint box software in 1986 Sorry, guys, I, I shouldn't say this, but they they have they not did nothing with 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 it. With it. They, you know, they talk about the iPad and how important that was. They don't even mention um, uh, and get right the the year that Hockney went on the paint box. So, to the BBC, can't they? sorry, you need to go to the BBC to be right? And it's weird, like that that none of that was like, ever spoken about. Yes. But at the end of the day. There was no interest or market with it. If you've got like a traditional painting market or prints or sculptures, people didn't know what to do with digital art. It was too early. So, so they were like, well, there's literally a great thing in, in France where they said, well, what would they expect us to do? Have like a TV screen on the wall? And I'm like, oh, the <laughs> NFT, you mean? Um, so, so what was nice was they got these, these different artists, Jennifer Bartlett, who is a very determined woman, shall we say, and she said... I'm not going to do anything that the computer wants me to do. I'm just going to paint on here, and I'm just going to paint this glass. And she painted all these vari variations of this glass. But I find her very fascinating because she almost had this like aversion to the machine and a battle against it. But she ended up doing really interesting things mm -hmm. and said all these philosophical great things about, hey, I've got nothing to take home with me. I've just spent two days on something. I can't even take yeah. anything home. That's really yeah. weird. Like, how, how is that? She wasn't complaining, but she was like, it's bizarre. How does it even exist? Right, which we're used to that. Now you post something on Instagram, nobody expects to take that home or look at it ever again, even. So Jennifer Bartler, one of the Painting with Light series, Richard Bernstein, he was famous. He, he came up with the Interview Magazine cover uh, logo for uh, Warhol. He's a friend of Warhol's and obviously a friend of uh, Grace Jones. Um, so, so did this. This was a dilemma for me because everyone knows that cover, and it's kind of iconic. But also, it is kind of a what how you would imagine the paint box and eighties graphics, which is of its time, which is fantastic. But I also wanted to get away from this. Is something I don't want to reinforce the obvious. Yeah. Um, hence, there's no Max Headroom in here, um, yeah. even though the titles for the chat show were done. But, and I actually prefer the inside of the sleeve, which to me is more subtle. Um, so we included both of those. Um, Chiara Bori, she's amazing because, well, they're all, they're all amazing people. She also sadly passed at the end of last year. She was in SIGGRAPH for a 20 year period, which is the longest ever. Um, CVF, if you ever remember that, uh, Peter, um, they were the first purchasers of the paint box in France. And uh, there's a great uh, magazine article which talks about um, the, the way the French, even the trade press wrote was crazy because they, they said, this paint box, uh, it got off the train at Montmartre station and it was like where women, abandoned women would be picked up by gentlemen who took advantage of them. And now there's these painters using this thing that's arrived from Newbury that nobody's a fresh you know, young thing or whatever. It's, it's like bizarre. 
But to use this, even though it looks so painterly, um, you know, I really wanted to include that in there. And it obviously says computer video film on the side. Now they, computer video film, did a show called Six Painters on a Computer in 1985 that was broadcast and was funded by the French government. Again, this is like an aside, but the French government did way more to promote graphics and uh, video technology than any other country. So they, <coughs> now bear in mind that this is all flight simulators and all of the, could be military and commercial applications of, of computer graphics. But they had literally had two and a half thousand people working for the government on developing computer graphics. They had nothing like the paint box. April Greenman. Nobody probably heard of her here, but a star to you. Yeah, I, I mean, she is. really, you know, created and developed this uh, this style of the '80s that um, that became, you know, so popular. And and I said to her, I said, and she had this great quote. Uh, yes, yeah, the Mac seemed like it mimicked everything the high-end paint boxes could do. And she said that basically she she learned everything on the paint box that later she would use on the Macs. And I said, oh, you know, have you got a couple of pieces? And she said, well, I've got a poster from the AIGA, which is the American Institute of Graphic Arts, about that obviously was done on the paint box. And she said, oh, and I've got a poster I did for MoMA uh, on posters that I did on the paint box. And I spoke to MoMA and I said, oh, you know, you're interested in doing anything on the, on the paint box? And they said, what's a paint box? Yeah. The first video, the first ever pop video that was taken into MoMA was the cars you might think that's in moma and moma have no idea no. about the paint box so it's, it's weird it's not only like the public it's actually some people i've included here because they're in academia etc and in museums none of even them and and i hate to kind of say it but blackpool uh, sorry not blackpool <laughs> bradford college which used to be the film and video and television um, uh, um, museum who were given a, a paint box by uh, Quantel uh, in the late 80s. And I spoke to a guy called Roger Thornton. I said, are you sure? Because they don't seem to have one anymore. And these are big things. You wouldn't lose it. Uh, and he said, no, I remember going up in the helicopter uh, and giving it to them. Because <laughs> that's what you did when that's you were Quantel. You yeah. And by the way, going in the, in the helicopter or, <coughs> or the, uh, the plane, Shit, it, it sounded like they had two planes in a helicopter, two jets, sorry, yeah, not planes. Yeah. And um, this sounds like a Trump kind of arrogant thing. Uh, obviously, it was a good sales technique. But people, literally, if you're in broadcast and you're on like German television and your paint box broke, you needed a card. You know, this isn't like now. You literally, the technician would get on a, on a plane and go you and take that card. That thing. So, so it seems like it's all kind of flash. It's a bit flash, but actually, it was it, really, it was it was a really good business tool as well. That you you needed yeah. something, you yeah. got it straight away. Yeah, in Europe anyway. Richard Hamilton, the father of uh, British pop art, yeah. or the father of pop art. Uh, so he did in the fifties or sixties this, this classic uh, classic uh, montage in the old way which was obviously cutting out pieces of paper and like we would do at school, you know, you get magazines and put these things together. So uh, the BBC asked him to do an update of it. I think it was 92 or something. So he did this version, um, it obviously incorporating things at a time. Yeah, I think there's Margaret Thatcher in there and uh, um, obviously talking about AIDS and things like that. Uh, replaced the TV dinner with a microwave dinner. Um, so, you know, it's funny because basically people were trying to promote the um, the paint box as this amazing tool that you'd never seen. You, you'd maybe see it now and again on Tomorrow's World, but it because it was always behind the scenes, nobody really knew about it. Keith Herring. Oh, so, crazily, I spoke to the guy, and he's like, I've got a 30-minute documentary. I've got eight of these illustrations. got the original Polaroids. I've got, you know, 10 animations. Some of them aren't even finished yet. Um, so I'm actually working with the Keith Herring Foundation who knew nothing about this and taking Keith's original work because it's on the Betamax tape, putting it onto my paint box, restoring it back to the exactly how it would have looked, you know, using color matching and, 
and the what you call jaggedy edges. Yeah. So to me, there's there's also an important thing in art where there's a uh, a digital fingerprint. Now you could say, well, we could do all this on our on our phone, and I do point out, well, yeah, but your phone doesn't, you know, the paint box didn't try and get you addicted. It didn't give you viruses. It didn't try and steal your bank. Well, actually, it did steal your bank account because it's quite a million pounds. But um, but the thing was, it definitely had this kind of digital fingerprint, and so that's what's really nice that all this stuff is appearing. When people say you can do that on Photoshop, actually, you can't. No. Because it, it isn't like that. And the guy who had the NFT, he said, you know, I did him a, a TIFF instead of a JPEG. And he said, well, can you send me a high resolution one? I said, I did send you the high resolution one. And he said, but it's only like, you know, 768 by 567 pixels. And I said, because it yeah. is only that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, that, and to me, that's the charm of the paint box. It's that, it, it's that age. You know, if you get a Model T Ford, you don't put a big, you know, electric engine in it or whatever, because it's not a Model T Ford anymore. Um, this, David Hogney. Uh, I remember getting this box of slides that, that, you know, was thrown out of Quantel years ago and looking at it, and I was like, well, who drew that? Like, who drew that? But it, yeah, it's David Hockney, and David Hockney said, well, it's kind of, none of these artists, what, what I love is, none of these artists, if this was a commercial show, would have given permission for any of these images to be used. Yeah. But because it's for a non-commercial computer art society show, they're all behind it. Every single one of these artists have said, we'd love to go in this show. And in fact, artists that I didn't include, like Howard Hodgkin are like, can we be in the next one or whatever? Um, and it, there's a whole thing. Obviously, if you're David Hockney or Keith Herring, there's people all the time saying, hey, I've got a Hockney, I've got a Herring, I've got this, this can you... Um, authenticate it so none of those warhol foundations will never authenticate anything but the hockney foundation said yeah yeah you can use it and can we have a copy of the catalog for our archives so i mean to me that's like so fantastic fantastic that like you know it's back where even the hockney archives never had this it's like yeah. it's like it, it didn't even exist for them so next one probably one of the most significant uh, pieces Martin Holbrook, who was, um, he was what you would call in the olden days, sorry for talking all No, 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 no. Um, he was what you would call a technical illustrator back in the day. So actually there's a book from before he joined Quantel where he illustrated all these ships. And I think as quite often happened, probably PT would say, there were people in Newbury that somebody said, hey, you want to come and work on this? It wasn't, people weren't flown in from around the world. There was somebody who knew somebody who could be good at this and you know, they, so I think Martin was one of those where he had some connection to Quantel and was brought in to help with the user interface. Uh, and he was, he was great at doing demonstrations and everything as well. And this was one of the, so these floppy disks, I was given all these uh, original manuals, etc., and all these eight inch floppy disks. Um, that was, that was one image that you'd have in the old days. So, I'm going through them all, and, and I managed to find uh, a guy in Leeds who, uh, it's funny because I spoke to Paul yesterday, and I said, oh, I've got these floppies, but you can't really read off them. And he's working with the National Computer Museum, and they just built a replica of, you know, the bomb machine that took 10 years. And, you know, sometimes in life where, where, you, see, where you have that, that scene on the Jungle Book where Mowgli is like punching Baloo and Baloo just looks down and goes, pitiful. <laughs> I said, oh, you're not, you, you can't read off these. And he said, no, but we can read off that. Everyone at the, at the museum could get the images off that. But anyway, I found somebody who could crack these because it was this enclosed system. Uh, and we found three images by Martin Holbrook uh, on those, which are probably, this is probably the earliest piece yeah. of art, uh, and it's on a 81 stroke 82 demo of the paint box where he talks about this. But being a true salesman, Paul did confirm, because he, he mentions in the video that he executed this in, um, in a period of 20 to 25 minutes, and Paul did shake his head at, at that, that claim. <laughs> Sounds like, really? The paint box is that fast? Now, the other thing to bear in mind is 
this, which is a recurring theme, uh, Spitfire, Quantel was, a, was until literally February this year, based in a former factory in Newbury that did build uh, parts for a Spitfire, uh, Spitfires in different planes in World War II. So that's why, you know, some of these themes recur, including when they launched one of their products, they did have a flyover yeah. uh, from, from the Spitfire and stuff. They, these are Ellen and Linda Kahn. I think they're, they're 1984, but I think they, yeah, 1982. So they they were uh, uh, identical twins, uh, artists as well, and they worked, I think, at NBC. Uh, and uh, I think they worked with MTV, their work is in Centre Pompidou and everything. Um, and again, you know, early people that, that just took this. And I think the good thing, you know, you touched on this before. It, you were doing something new. And the thing is, if you, you, you only get judged, really, if somebody says, well, this is how it should be. Yeah. So you working on a paint box, it wasn't a stream of men working on paint boxes before you because the paint box didn't exist. Yeah. So you were probably more accepted yeah. as well. Because, yeah. because you had to accept the whole concept and a woman it, yeah, working on it wasn't, wasn't any unusual thing. There's Leah, Lu, Leah Luban. Uh, also, I'll just say as well, contacting, uh, getting in touch with um, Martin Holbrook's daughter, for instance. You know, there's all these connections where people have never seen their father's art. Uh, to, to have the last talk I did um, was really nice. It was, you know, one of the director's birthdays that the daughter-in-law told me and things like that. Um, so to have these people who their own father they've never even seen their work. Uh, it's really amazing. So Leah Luban, uh, she, amazing activist woman. Um, her, her work was in the Six Painters uh, and a computer. Uh, and sadly, there's, there's literally, I'd heard about this video. It took me a year to find it. And I found this copy. The person where computer video film, where it was, where it was created, the owner of that, who was Chiara Bori's husband, uh, is Kiara or his husband. Um, he'd never even seen this video. There's one copy that's in the National Library of France. I contacted the National Library of France. Hey, I'm doing a documentary. Can I see this? And they said, yes, you can go into any of the main libraries in France and look at it on a terminal. That's it. You can't ever see it. They won't ever release it. So to get these is really, I know it doesn't seem amazing, but it's, it, it's like the end of a long trail of trying to find these things. This one, um, our, I'm, I just don't feel like I should describe this one. You're going to do a better job. Oh, you're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an album cover for the, the UK uh, band back in the day. Just one of, uh, that was around the time, just that was after the MTV branding, I think. I don't recall. But yeah, one of very many difficult things to choose from. Very difficult to choose a single image for a book. Yeah, we did have a discussion about... We did. We did I had a different favorite image. Yeah. And you had this one. Yeah. Uh, but I think you made the right choice. Yeah, the other looks, one was very commercial. Looks, looks great. Sidney Nolan, if you watch Painting with Light mm -hmm. with Sidney Nolan, um, he does this thing which is called Sculpture for Sydney Harbour. Oh, yeah. And he doesn't actually finish this on the, on the program. He, he, there's none of those colored lights on the arch. It's just kind of a crisscross. This is the final image that the note, Sydney Nolan Trust have never seen this. Um, Stephen Partridge, this is something, again, I've tried to pick these people for varied reasons. Obviously, it's a very graphic image, this, which, you know, you imagine the paint boxes to do with graphics. Um, um, so I wanted to include this. The other thing is that paint box uh, Quantel gave a paint box to, to Duncan of Jordanston College in Dundee. They built, because of that, a whole TV art studio around it, which became really famous and created all these famous artists. Um, and what is amazing is um, I spoke to one of the lecturers there um, about this, and Stephen said, oh, could you get me a better copy of this uh, image? Um, so he got this image, and I spoke to him. And he said, oh, I've got, we've still got a paint box. We've got a paint box, a, a Harriet. And he said, 
they've tried throwing it away so many times. And I'm like, you're not, you're not throwing this away. This is really important. So now I've connected with a guy who's going to fix it. So it's working again. And I spoke to the guy, Mark Nias, who fix, fixes all these things, basically. And uh, I said, it's just fantastic because this guy, this lecturer, loves this machine. And he, like I've shown it to young people, will show it to all these new students. And they'll all learn not only about the history, but they'll actually go on something that's just still this fantastic creative tool. So, you know, for that to happen, um, and this guy... Again, it's just it's just releasing this Pandora's box that everyone goes, oh, I've got this and I can show this and so we can do Mark? that again. The so Mark, fixer. Mark's in Manchester. Ah. It's, uh, yeah. Um, and we're just getting overloaded with stuff. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've just got, I've been offered loads of different things, you know, because of this publicity, people pop up and say, uh, literally, the one I picked up today, guys, I have, I've got an edit box in my garage. So, you know, uh, it's just, been there for 10 years do you think you could and they all say exactly the same thing adrian if you can get that going, get again, going again i'd just yeah. love to see that go oh. in again now how many people would say with photoshop one or the iphone 2 or something oh i'd just like to see that again and that's what i mean it's just like love of this technology so there's there's an album cover by an ice more set which very much replicates that picture. Uh, this one? Yeah. Wow, look at that. Oh, yeah. What date's that now? Um, 1998. So I doubt it was on our paint box. But, uh, so this was commissioned by Channel 4. Yeah, it was like a, an art show uh, thing. State. Yeah. In 1990. It's so alike. It must be based on it, surely. Yeah. Yeah. One way or the other. Which way? <laughs> well, I don't know if we should touch <laughs> on things getting copied, because obviously yeah. at some point we have to mention Photoshop and the lawsuit. The famous dun, lawsuit, dun, dun, but dun, 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 dun. we're up to number 13. Which one? We're sticking with art. Um, Kiki Picasso. So, this was this. So, Kiki Picasso, I went to, uh, I was invited, as lots of people were, uh, down because I was a photography student working on the paint box. They said, We're doing this graphic paint box. Do you want to come and give your opinion and see it and whatever? The biggest problem with the graphic paint box um, was. And I went to see, there's, there's a company called Electric Paint that an ex, ex Quantel employee set up in California and did all these movie titles, you know, uh, Terminator, all these things. He did all the, all the posters. Tony Redhead. Tony Redhead. And, um, and basically, the guy who worked there said, the worst thing is we had this great big HD TV screen and everyone that saw this screen had never seen anything like it. They just sat there like, oh, like this. And, he said, we, we always made it an event. We invited all the mm. bands in because he did all these band covers or whatever. Everyone was excited. Uh, but then you'd see a print from it and you'd be like, oh, well, yeah. I'm to all the color. <laughs> because, of course, one is transmitted light. Right. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at your phone, you can never get a print that looks as good as the, the phone because it's, it's transmitted light rather than reflected. Mm. So <laughs> anyway, Kiki, I went down to New York, uh, to Newbury and uh, they scanned some of my images in and we're using them for demo stuff. And then I was told, oh, Kiki Picasso uh, used your art. We used it for the brochure, which I was happy about. Uh, I've got some early brochures here, they did. Um, but Kiki Picasso used your work for, for when he was on experimenting with the graphic paint box and he bought one. So I was like, oh, Kiki Picasso, look at this. So anyway. I, all these years later, I've contacted Kiki, and um, he gave me, like, again, he was great because he output everything on what was called a film recorder, so you got slides, so you didn't have to try and crack a, a disc or whatever. Massive slides, yeah. So uh, we picked this image, uh, which was a bit of a dilemma, to be honest with you, because mm. obviously that's uh, Nelson, uh, sorry, Nelson, that was Desmond Tutu, um, and I asked, oh, well, uh, and that's, that's, uh, um, Winnie Mandela, and I was like, "Oh yeah, but oh, Winnie Mandela," and he's, but it's just a great image, and she wasn't seen in that way. That obviously the things that happened later, and that is just a joyous image. And you would never consider that as as a paint box or '80s graphics. And I think just just sweeping through these images, um, again, Larry Rivers. If you, well, you're all old enough. You remember Scritti Politti, right? Yeah. 
So apparently, uh, yeah, they had somebody lined up, uh, but Green from Scritti Politi, who was the, you know, the thing back then, um, Larry did a, a portrait of him. Um, so you would never consider that. And I think that was the, the beauty of that show. It was showing that it was, uh, you know, there was lots of different styles of people who did graphic things and visual things. Um, John Sanborn and Dean Winkler. If you ever get the chance, there was a, a, a TV show on like public broadcast TV in America. It's called like Night Shift or Nighttime or something. And they demonstrate, ironically enough, Quantel started making effects. Um, you know, this, this idea that you could put an image into another image and then make it bounce around the screen was, and I don't mean to be dismissive, but it was an effect, wasn't it, really? So it was an amazing effect. Obviously, he's staring at me now, saying it wasn't just an effect. But it was an effect, and you saw it. like, And with Mirage, where you see the page turn in it, and then it would go into an apple and go off into the distance. <clears throat> Those were effects. Now, John and Dean, uh, John actually, uh, sorry, Dean ended up setting up a place called Post Perfect, I think it was. Uh, Quantel had what they call sister post-production houses where they would give equipment to, uh, you know, they would get feedback when they would work with. They were one in New York. Um, but if you try and find that, the, the, it was like the days of this early learning of switches and pe people using technology, which Namjung Pei did, where, where you would get video and add noise to it and make it go snowy. And uh, it was artists really, like, remember Laurie Anderson? Yeah. That, that kind of yeah. thing, where you're playing around with video as a medium, as an art thing, and getting bits of technology and putting wires in the wrong way and stuff. So that's why I wanted to include this. And it seems very much like a 80s graphic thing, but it was really, you know, that was really like forward for its time, and that was commissioned by um, Boston Art Gallery, an uh, 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 animated feature for them. And I'm pretty sure they don't even know that that's Paintbox. Mechteld Schmidt Feist. Hopefully, sorry if you got it wrong. Um, so, yeah, I, again, I saw her work in SIGGRAPH. It was like one of the few Quantel pieces, and I really like it. I mean, so, it, you know, it's abstract, it's painterly. And uh, and she was like, where did you get that image? And I said, oh, it's in Sigma. She said, I, I had no idea. And uh, and she's the head of NYU, what's his, the uh, professor of digital communication and media at NYU for 20 years. So that's the other thing. It Cute. launched amazing careers as well. And again, you know, people weren't stereotyped or pigeonholed um, just because they're male or female. Hervé Telemac, um, this is literally uh, one of his, he did this for six painters as well. Now, Kim was worried, because as much as I talked about everything being low resolution, <coughs> this is a screen grab that I took off that really badly, you know, distorted video that I found. And Kim said, look at it. <laughs> it's going to print <laughs> terrible. It's going to print terrible. Now, and when I was at college, when the paint box arrived, I was at college with my best friend here, Duncan, the best man at a wedding, all this kind of stuff. We've known each other for years. And he was like a typical photography student, not typical, <coughs> you know, boring. But what everyone was doing was shooting on 10 by 8 transparencies. It was like, oh, we're going to do 48 sheet posters. Don't ever shoot on 35 millimeter. You know, that's for amateurs. You know, this is how big our transport. Look at this. And then, of course, I'd be like, oh, look at this, you know, like, and it's one pixel, you know, wide. So, obviously, they dismissed it as being just terrible quality. And I always say, if you if you look at the quality of something, like, the material, nobody looks at a, a, a Picasso or, or munches the scream and go, yeah, but look at all those dabs everywhere. <laughs> like, that's like, it's only like 12 pixels, that image, you know. You have to respect so that the image, time where it's come from. If you look at it, and I said, well, everyone's going to look at it from 10 feet away as well anyway, but I don't know if you can see, but on the top left, there's the monitor, and there's the, the pen that's going that he's drawing on, and that's his self-portrait of him in a kind of a cubist way doing something on the paint box, and I think it's just a fantastic image. And if anyone says, 
I feel like I'm going to take Paul's at you. Everyone says, well, it's a bit fuzzy. I'll say, well, you, you can't appreciate art then, can you really? It's probably one MB. You know, it's that classic thing. If you go in the art gallery and you remember the frame around the painting, it's a crap painting. Uh, the trouble these days is that obviously with desktop publishing, you know, with InDesign, you could miss, you, know, you could swap out a JPEG, a low res. You know, that's the thing. So it's sort of like, what happened to these? Are they low res JPEGs that have right. swapped in? A bit like the auto auto correct but, spelling. But I also consider, like, if you found a piece of art that was like, I went with my wife today with the Tower of London and, you know, we saw all these different, you know, think, historic things over the last day. Now, you see something that's ancient, you know it's ancient, and it, if it's all damaged and rusty or whatever, it kind of adds to it, right? So I don't see why digital images... Yeah. Uh, of course, at some point, I was like, the Keith Herring thing is interesting because I'm going to restore those, and I want those to be... Re Oops. Oh, I thought, is that me? Um, the... the what I love when you zoom into a digital image is that you do see that jagged edge. And actually, that's just Photoshop or any viewing device. It's just you zooming in. The, uh, and actually, if you try and print it that size, it just goes fuzzy. So actually, I've worked out a way using uh, uh, a very analog solution, which is zoom in and do a screenshot and stitch them all together of uh, showing that. But the other, obviously, I did some tests thinking, oh, I'll put it through Topaz and all these different things. And it adds artifacts and it adds all these things, which would be cool if you try and show what Topaz does. But to me, the fact that this is from a completely, there's only one of these videos in the world and that looks like that, that adds to it. it does, it's not detrimental. Oh, look, there's, there's me. <laughs> so that's Ian Clark on the left uh, of that with his mouth open. Uh, this, I should say, is before the Queen album cover, but obviously it's so much better than me. Um, <laughs> and uh, to the right, you know, both of this was really about my, my, you know, I was confused, really, because I was doing something that nobody, nobody as far as I knew was doing it, and I couldn't Google that anyone else was doing it. I assumed people in America were, because in those days, and bearing in mind, I was, I was in a warehouse in Manchester, so I presumed everyone else was doing it, and I had no clue. Because <laughs> in those days, if something was, was in Creator Review, uh, you know, that's where you would find your work and see what other people were doing. But no one was doing this kind of thing, um, and there was no market for it, uh, and it was hard work. It was a pain in the neck, to be honest. But what I like about this, why I've included this image, is because it says, Adrian Wilson, new photography. <laughs> I hadn't, nobody had given me the name for it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't called Paintbox yet. It wasn't called Photoshop yet. It wasn't called NFTs yet or, or AI. Um, Here's the first image on the right. So the one on the right, that had taken it. Um, back in the day uh, when, when we were at college, you would use, uh, in fact, Lisa is here, you would, you would basically do shoots for hairdressers because basically, in those in the 80s, you know, with Vidal Sassoon and everything, they'd be doing all these, you know, bizarre hairstyles. They'd have these great models. They'd do all the styling. And of course, as a photo student, you couldn't afford to get somebody to do that. So you'd go to these hair conventions and stuff, mm -hmm. or hair, you know, award winning things, um, and, and offer to photograph those people. So that actually was this woman from that that had photographed. But as you see, it's actually a strip of 35 mil film that's kind of spiraling. And obviously, I could read. I, 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 I was 21. I'm sure I didn't think that much into it. But now looking at it, you know, as an out of student experience or whatever, um, I obviously was confused about what, what this means and, you know, the face and how it's distorted. And, uh, you know, you've got this spiral of digital stuff, but it's film, but it's all, you know, going out of control or something. So, you know. I didn't necessarily think all that at the time, but obviously I also was confused by even what I was doing. Um, and you can't, you know, you were saying before about doing things that were commercial. I couldn't do things that were commercial because people say, what is that? Yeah. And they'd say, oh, can you do it? You know, like when Terminator 2 came out, oh, can you do liquid metal? And um, I did a James album cover and it's, it is liquid, it's called Gold Mother, and I did liquid metal. And everyone's like, how did you do that? I didn't tell them, uh, but I reflected a, a picture in some tin foil because <laughs> that's how it was. And somebody said, can you do this head coming out of the 
like Tron and revolving around and going back down. And me and a friend did it, um, Chris, using some fishnet stocking and some lift film and said, well, yes, yeah, computery. And oh, it's two weeks to render it, you know, like whatever. Because because I did paint box. Because no one knew. Yeah. And they said, oh, you do computers. You do computers was a phrase. <laughs> yeah, no, so, maybe, yeah. So, yeah, you were, you were kind of cutting edge, but also it's weird. In one sense, everyone thought you were amazing. In another sense, nobody had a clue what you were doing. So you had to describe everything, which is your job. Um, so it was, it, was, it was, I wouldn't, being first or being early on, early adopter, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't, it, it, it was a lot of effort. It was very tiring. Mm. Um, and so I quit in 1990. Um, and then this is Brandon. Ah, oh, bless him. So, so on on the user interface, uh, it says Quantel Paintbox. I actually want to change it so it says uh, TikTok Beta or something similar. So young people don't realize it's old software. So I said to Brandon, um, and he basically designs AI and all this kind of stuff, and uh, you know VR. He's into all that stuff. So he said, oh, yeah, I'd love to come on this. Literally within five minutes, he's working away. And uh, I said, oh, you know, and he said, firstly, the user interface that just says painting, chalk, graphics, whatever. He said, this user face is exactly like I work with a lot of beta software, beta software. And this is how it looks before they make it look branded and everything. It's exactly like this. And I said, I do warn you, there's no undo button. And he said, oh, well, it's funny that. I said, why? He said, well, we have this thing where we're designing for the VR community and there's this piece of software and it had no undo button on it. And everyone's like, what the hell? And they said, it's virtual reality. You have to get it right first time. And I was like, God, it's Paul again. It's Paul. <laughs> and, uh, and apparently on Discord, they, they berated the software people for six months and finally said, okay, we'll put an undo button in. So I thought it was kind of hilarious that there was these links to now. And obviously that was done uh last year uh, the end of last year so i also wanted this wide spectrum to also be chronologically yeah. wise and one of the things i want to do and i'm doing is just inviting any artist to come on this because a they'll fall in love with it and you know everyone who uses it pretty much does um which is great publicity and it also a bit like a classic car if you've got an e-type jag and you just put it in the garage and you don't drive it i mean this this should be used so that's why i i feel privileged that i can bring that to people as well so that's that's my list and why i chose them and i think it is if you looked at that some of it you wouldn't even think it was digital art and you certainly wouldn't equate it with 80s and you may even look at it and say, hey, that's got to be 90s, really. That's afterwards. You know, well, that was 90s. Sorry. But, yeah. I think that's a really good um, time to maybe stop for a bit. But I don't think we should necessarily finish unless people have to leave, because I think we should have some questions. Or maybe we have a discussion. And let do you, do you, well, do you, do you want to add I'm happy. to any of that? No, do you want to add to any of the... Uh... By the way... Uh, yesterday just to so let me so the end of this everyone everyone says oh well Quantel failed as a company and I say that's can you use the word bollocks people on the sure. internet won't know what bollocks is will they? <laughs> so that's bollocks firstly name any technical company any technology company like Nokia or or you know even Philips now don't even make anything didn't make CDs or you know, for years, how many technology companies are going after 15 years and their product is is still working? Quantel lasted longer than that. They will dominate it for 15 years. So, you know, to base something off Apple or, or, you know, these two companies maybe that might have survived is wrong because technology companies just through market changes or you're relying on one invention don't. Um, so the other thing is that if you look at so what happened was uh, Quantel got, got sold and bought by different companies, so they have a different management structure. So as Kim described, the way that the, and how Chris said, how, how the customer was treated, how staff were treated, how it was kind of like just run for a passion, really. You know, 
people will say who worked there, I know um, uh, he said yesterday, he didn't plan to make a business. It wasn't to make money. It was like they, they just really enjoyed what they were doing. And it was kind of a byproduct that was because they, they invented something so great and successful. Um, but Quantel never acquired, you can correct me on this, but they never acquired any other companies. And in fact, uh, I said to Paul yesterday, you know, why didn't you uh, think of buying any other companies? And he said, well, we did think of buying Apple. <laughs> and I said, really? He, he, he said, yeah, yeah, there's like, Maybe for like, you know, a short time, we thought, oh, we'll buy Apple. And then I said, well, why didn't you buy them? And he said, they weren't really going to add anything to our company, which sounds like a, an arrogant statement. But he said, we wouldn't add anything to theirs either. They were a different sphere. We had our system. And in fact, uh, the graphic paint box, uh, there's Tony Redhead developed this dongle that could communicate between yeah there's a apple. i had brought a brochure with me with that thing with the apple yeah. and the um um mm. and the um with the with photoshop and apple uh and the graphic paint box and he um apparently said to whoever it was at quantel hey um you know apple would love to like you know open up your software and like oh, yeah. work together and the reply from quantel was well, why don't you open up your software? Mm -hmm. like, why should we? And so to me, it was like a really interesting thing that Paul said yesterday. He said, look, we had a company. When we launched something, it did what it said. Like we didn't make any promises. There was a famous uh, 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 broadcast show where Quantel had done this 3D mirage thing that could create all this 3D stuff. And there was a competitor who had this TV screen with like this, vase that was revolving round and Paul said I went round the back and there was like a turntable <laughs> with a vase on it because they said well we could do we it, couldn't do it. Like, no. you know we'll do it in the future and it's like Pfft. and uh, and actually the guy at, at uh, electric paint and we're talking about different you know art that he's done he said my my most annoying upsetting thing that I did and he showed me the transparency and he said look this was done on the paint box and it was a split thing I tried to find the ad, and it was a forest with a little clearing on one side, and on the other side, there was a photo paint boxed in, there was a house. And I said, why does that upset you so much? He said, because that, the agency for Apple came and said, we want to show what Apple and Photoshop can right. do. And he said, but it can't do that. Why are you coming to us to do it? And he said, but it will be able to do it. We want to show what it will be able to do. And Paul, Paul did make that point. He said, I can stand here now and say, whatever we said, our paint, any of our products could do, they could do it at that point. It wasn't a promise. You know, those kind of values and the way, so when you talk about, you know, Quantel, hey, it did this and didn't do that. Yeah, Adobe is this, you know, $7 billion company. But who likes Adobe? You know, the, mm -hmm. if you look at the Adobe's Wikipedia page, they got all these things about how they screwed customer pricing, how they shut other company software companies down. They turned into a horrible predatory monopoly. Whereas, as you can see, I know, as I say, I'm doing that Tom Cruise thing, but there's a general love for Quantel and the, the, for a good reason. Well, I think it, I'm sure there are people here who would like to ask questions and have a chat. So I think what we should do is I, I'll, I'd like to wind up with a few things sure and then if people want to stay around they can use this room chat here or you can go downstairs to the bar and, and have a chat there so a, a few things that sort of popped out to me actually thinking about the history of the paint box one is i think one of the reasons it's not properly integrated into what you might call the mainstream canon of digital arts history is because it was commercial and there is a sort of snobbery amongst certain elements of art which doesn't like commercial stuff now, of course, it's changed now. These days, many artists are very commercial and use commercial technologies. But I do wonder if there's a little bit of that, because it was a commercial technology done by people who got paid well. Yeah. It wasn't really seen the same as digital art at the time. That's just a, a thought. We could explore well, that. Yeah, and there's a double thing as well, because mm. video has always been looked down on by the film industry. Mm. You know, if you, if you, you know, Paul has a couple of Emmys on his, on his <clears> window ledge. If there were Oscars, people are like, oh, wow, you've won an Oscar. Yeah. There's hundreds of them going out. But actually, any video yeah. awards, 
they're all uh, video is always seen as the poor yeah. cousin of, of film well, i suppose like television <coughs> used to be it probably isn't now because there's some great television around. right yeah so, i thought i'd make that point because that might be something that um, we chat about at some point and then also for me when i i obviously knew about the faint box before we started talking but i didn't know it as i do now and um I think that really, uh, I think, interested me was the idea that the paint box established a medium. It was a piece of technology, yeah. but it enabled you to do things that you couldn't do before. Yeah. And it started to d develop this digital art, digital the manipulation media. medium. Yeah. And I think that, to me, makes it a very interesting piece of technology. Because if you look at certain technologies now, maybe you look at NFT. I'm not a great fan of NFT. It sounds like you're not as well. One of the problems I find with NFT is that most of the things I see that have been turned into NFTs don't inherently use NFT as a medium. They mm. don't do something special. Mm. They really just see it as a way of distributing work and monetizing it. Yeah. And but that's valid. People need to earn a living. But it doesn't make the art better, okay. as far as I'm concerned. So the thing I like about the paint box is it established a medium and the artist started exploring the medium, coming up with a new language. And there are these images, we can make sense of these images because this language that they're using right. has been established. Yeah. It's a foundation. Yeah, exactly. it's developed and everything. Yeah, yeah. So I want that. Um, and also I want to make a general point that if anybody has an old paint box they don't <laughs> want, um, the Computer Arts Archive, the projects um, that I run with various people here, would be more than happy to look after it. So just um, so would I. that. So it's also on the um, so would recording. I. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, again. And then another important thing is that this is a, um, a catalogue that's um, Kim has produced for the exhibition. You can get this catalogue for free online. Go to the Computer Arts Society website. You can download a nice PDF and um, distribute it however you wish. However, what you can also do, if you have a in front of me, is that we have a limited number of printed copies. And I'm going to put these on the Computer Arts Archive shop. But I guess as we've got them, if anybody was interested in buying one, I'm sure you'd be happy to sign them. Oh, yeah. 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 And they're going to be £10 each. But like I said, a PDF is free, but if you'd like a physical book, it's there. And I think likewise with these, these haven't even been signed yet, but we have produced an exhibition poster, um, which you'll both hopefully sign as an archival print. And we're going to sell these online in the shop. But I think if people wanted to take them away now, although they wouldn't have any packaging, they wanted to buy one, going to be selling those for £40 each and the reason I'm doing the selling bit at the end is because we don't really in this one in particular we don't have any financial support for these exhibitions and the Computer Art Society is part of the BCS which can be decided and some of the exhibitions that we've run we started to get some funding through but this one we sort of took on a life of its own so it's out of that sort of funding cycle so we're using these little bits of fundraising to cover some of the costs of the exhibitions but, like I say, you can download it for free. I'm not going to do a hard sell on in any way. Um, so and it should point out that the, this, these hot, this heron, nobody well, has seen to this say, heron before. You've got approval for us to use it. You won't see that anywhere that, else. That's, that's the world exclusive release of the Keith heron mm. that no one has ever seen. That I mean, and basically, I'm allowed to print it for the yeah. exhibition, but that's it. Can so, you print it? We're, 40, uh, yeah. <laughs> we've, got, we've got 16 of the posters for the uh, and we've got 30 of the catalogues for sale right. i've printed um 50. um so they're going to be limited we might do some more for the next showing of the exhibition Very little, it's not yeah. going to be um, huge numbers so if people are interested go to the computer art society website and we've got a shop there we could even go to the shop there on your phone and purchase them here um and maybe some people even use cash i don't know. sure we should do a vote now would would it would people prefer to obviously Keith can't sign them, but would people prefer that we sign them or or they were left blank? Or do you sign them as Keith? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, what do you think? Well, Who thinks we should sign them because we yeah, curated the exhibition? Hands so up, on please. The poster. Who oh. thinks we shouldn't sign them? 